So what we're going to talk about today, and I'm going to share a couple of slides just to kind of help us through that, but you can see my face on the side video if, if you like. We're talking about this idea of beautiful risks of moving towards pedagogies of the possible. So I think it's important first to unpack a little bit uh, what I mean by a beautiful risk. So anytime we take a risk, there are potential hazards and potential benefits. And so when we talk about good risks, many of us understand good risks as the benefits outweigh the potential hazards. So in the case of learning, this could be, you know, face-to-face -face learning or hybrid or online learning. Whenever a young person has a question um, or needs help, it's obviously a good risk from our perspective as an educator to raise your hand and ask for assistance or ask that question. But it's still a risk uh, for that student because the student might fear appearing incompetent. There may be other students who may laugh at the other student. So there are potential hazards, but if we think about it in the context of learning, even in the case that there may be some hazards, it's still a good risk uh, to go ahead and ask the questions because the benefits of learning outweigh the potential hazards. And then of course there are bad risks. Uh, so a bad risk would be, for example, we see these three individuals here feeding a bear peanut butter. <laughs> so this is a, a potentially bad risk because the hazards of interacting with a bear in the wild and trying to feed a bear, which is very powerful, peanut butter might outweigh, and certainly I would argue outweigh the potential benefits of you know having this kind of exciting experience. So this is certainly a bad risk. It's also important to understand that when it is uh, time to maybe help somebody else or do something and we don't act, that's also a bad risk because we our actions could have helped others. So when we think of good and bad risk, we're usually thinking about um, individuals or ourselves. You know, we're doing that kind of cost benefit analysis. So then what are beautiful risks? Well, I argue that a beautiful risk is when we do something that may not work out, but the potential benefits um, can lead to benefiting the learning and lives of others. So this is really where we're thinking about others. We're trying to push learning beyond the self into the classroom, beyond the walls of the classroom and out into the world. And so an example of a beautiful risk um, is this young person, um, Natalie Hampton, who was experiencing some isolation um, in school and particularly during lunchtime, sometimes um, young people, uh, particularly in some of our schools here in the States, when they're in the middle grades or even in um, senior level school, may not feel like they have friends they can sit with. And it can be a very kind of embarrassing and, and terrible experience. And so what this person did is developed an app that could ask, could let people know that, you know, you're looking for somebody to sit with um, and would they be willing to have you come sit with them to eat lunch, for example. And so she developed this app based on her own experiences of feeling isolated and maybe uh, you know, made fun of if she went to sit down and they told her no. So she built this app, you know, it, and again, it's a beautiful risk because it may not work out, but it did in fact turn out to be something that could benefit the learning and lives of others by giving them a way to connect with people who would be friendly and, and not make it um, an embarrassing experience for everyone. And so, and then on the right here, you know, there's a shameless plug for my book, Beautiful Risks, where I talk about beautiful risks throughout um, teaching and learning. And so we're gonna kind of move to that from the kind of vantage point now of an educator. Uh, we're gonna look at how do we move towards these pedagogies of the possible and why is it in fact a beautiful risk? So hopefully you understand the concept of beautiful risk. Now let's talk about the beautiful risk of moving towards pedagogies of the possible. So I would like you to consider um, one study, but there are various examples. And I think you could probably imagine some of these in your own work, um, and certainly I can. But here's an example from a recent study in the States where uh, two creativity researchers, they were um, measuring a variety of different factors as students were moving from secondary school to university. And what they found is this interesting um, pattern where young people who scored the highest in their class, so they had the highest grades in their class, tended to have the lowest levels of creative confidence. And so the researchers in this indicated that students who are more academically successful may be less likely to consider themselves to be creative. 
Um, and I think this is a troubling, uh, as a creativity researcher, I find this very troubling, but also as an educator, I find this to be troubling. So kids who are very good at school tend not to think that they have you know, good ideas, that they have a strong imagination that they can come up with new ideas. And so this study actually used a measure of creative confidence that I developed in 2006 to look at this relationship. So the question is, why might this be the case? Why might good students feel like they don't have good ideas or, have, or don't really have confidence in their own ideas? And I would argue that one reason, I think the predominant reason is, is that we as educators and sometimes as parents and sometimes as coaches tend to over plan young people's learning experiences. So when we're planning a learning or designing a learning experience, again, whether it's face-to-face -face or online or a hybrid, we tend to over plan. So we tend to plan everything down almost to the last minute where students really don't have a chance to test out their own ideas. In fact, what I would argue is in this place called school, regardless of where it's digitally mediated or again, face to face, success is often defined as doing what's expected by the teacher and how it's expected. So that leaves very little room for kids to do something different. So even if kids meet expectations, if they don't do it in the expected way, that's sometimes not seen as successful. Uh, and so this is, I would argue, kind of the prototypical core of a pedagogy that I call the pedagogy of sameness. Um, and my colleague Vlad Glavino and I have been working on thinking about, okay, if we're moving towards a pedagogy of possible, what are we moving away from? And I would say we're moving away from a pedagogy of sameness. And, you know, again, before I talk about that, yes, it's important that kids sometimes learn to do what's expected and how it's expected, but we also need to provide them with opportunities to do, to solve problems that they themselves identify, to solve them in their own way and to demonstrate they learn that in their own way so that we need to kind of open that up because the pedagogy of sameness really in school is having you know, the same age group of young people, whether they're in secondary school, higher education, university, or even primary school, are doing the same thing in the same way at the same time. And so you know, around the world, we see these kind of pedagogies of sameness. And so again, there are times when this may be beneficial, but if this is the kind of prototypical schooling experience, then being successful in this space does nothing really for young people when they're being asked to come up with their own problems to solve and their own ways to solve them, not only later in life, but right now. So I, I would argue that we are wasting much time spending these, you know, designing these pedagogies of sameness when we could be moving towards pedagogies of the possible. So what is a pedagogy of the possible? How do we move from these pedagogies of sameness and open them up to provide young people with the opportunity to engage in new possibilities and also to contribute to the learning and lives of others, including educators. So I would argue when we move from pedagogy to sameness where everything's predetermined and really it's almost like a game of intellectual hide and seek, guess what I as, your, as the educator or designer of the learning experience want you to know and how you want to know it to here are some criteria, show us how you can meet those in different ways where I as the designer can even learn or the educator can even learn and certainly others in the space and beyond. So let's unpack some of the features of a pedagogy of the possible. So again, like I mentioned, my colleague Vlad Glavenau and I've been working on this concept of pedagogies of the possible and we're working on a volume uh, with Cambridge University Press where we're gonna be really showcasing these. So if you have examples of pedagogy of the possible, you can always email me offline and we'd be happy to maybe schedule a time and, and talk to you about that and perhaps even showcase it in the volume. But for our purposes today, let's just look at some of the features of a pedagogy of the possible. Now, what we would argue is pedagogy of the possible really are designs of creative teaching and learning. And they, they basically have at least four components. One is that they're designed with some open-endedness. So everything is not predetermined as in the pedagogy of sameness, that there are some to be determined elements that we by design, design those into the space. So that could be, stu be asking students to identify their own problems to solve, like I mentioned, or their own ways of solving them or demonstrating their own solutions. So there is this kind of blend between maybe some predetermined non-negotiable learning criteria, but then open-endedness in how students meet those criteria. So open-endedness is the first. 
Then there's a non-linearity to it. So pedagogy is the same as are very linear. It moves across time. There's typically a sequence that students follow in a very linear way. But when we design pedagogy as the possible, because there's open-endedness and there's multiple ways to arrive at outcomes and goals, we see that there's this non-linear approach that students move back and forth. There's a little bit of a messiness to the process. There's iterations. Students might be working on one project or problem and decide that really there's a deeper issue. So they, they shift and move to a different direction and so on. So nonlinearity um, and open-endedness kind of play off each other. Importantly, there's a plurality of perspectives. So as a creativity researcher, what we recognize in the field is creativity doesn't do well in sameness, in, in pedagogies of sameness. Creativity actually requires difference, right? Because if everyone's doing the same thing and it's already predetermined, there's little room for creative expression. So a pedagogy of, of the possible would design with plurality of perspectives to encourage young people to engage with various perspectives and experiences, not only with other peers, but beyond the classroom. So we're bringing in different views, different from what the teacher maybe understands or expects. And then finally, there's a future orientation. So again, since we're moving to new possibilities, we're focusing on something, on generating and creating something that is coming into being that we don't already know is what, what's gonna happen. So this can be a very terrifying moment for educators because oftentimes we feel that our competence is linked to knowing exactly what's gonna happen next, having very clear learning goals, very specified timeframes, knowing exactly what it's gonna look like, how we're gonna get there, how much time we're spending. And again, we can hold on to some of these predetermined criteria, but if we open a pedagogy of the possible, we're really inviting new possibilities of learning to manifest that we may have never even imagined before. And so this is somewhat theoretical. I'm gonna give you a very concrete example of this in a moment, but I want you just to kind of think about these four features of pedagogies of the possible that kind of define these kind of creative and teaching learning experiences and start thinking, how could you design or maybe redesign some of the educational experiences that you prepare for young people? How could you incorporate open-endedness, non-linearity, plurality of perspectives, and a future orientation? So let's take a little bit of a closer look here. As we kind of move towards designing um, these kind of pedagogies of the possible, we have to ourselves prepare ourselves and prepare young people to engage with creative openings that have uncertainty around them, but also to design for creative openings. So let's look at this difference. So I would argue even when we design in kind of a pedagogy of sameness, a lesson plan, and, and we know this from our lives, you can plan your life as, as much as possible, but when the lesson you plan or the, the life you plan meets the lesson or your life as lived, there are always gaps. There are always surprising moments. Um, and this idea of the lesson as planned meeting the lesson as lived as being this kind of generative space is an idea that came from a curriculum theorist named Ted Aoki out of Canada. And he talked about, we often have these ruptures in our lessons and our lives. And as educators, we sometimes quickly try to shut those down and return to the lesson as planned. And what he invites us to do and what I invite us to do is to see these as creative opportunities, these moments of uncertainty as openings to perhaps something new, more generative. And so we have to kind of have the courage and take the beautiful risks to step into those creative openings. And some of those creative openings are more kind of abrupt than others, some are very subtle. And so part of it is attuning ourselves to being able to notice them when they emerge, even in very well predetermined lessons. So what we're gonna do in the next moment, I'm gonna show you a video clip here in a moment of a classroom that's from the University of Michigan. It's on their website. Um, it's publicly available and, and I'll give you the citation for it. And we're gonna take a look at it as an idea of how do you step into a creative opening to move away from a pedagogy of sameness to a pedagogy of the possible and what are the outcomes of doing so? So we're gonna zoom in on one example of this. So this is my idea of, let's just zoom in on one moment of this. And so the context is a grade three classroom Students have been learning about odd and even numbers. So they've been learning about the number line. They've been learning that, for example, three is an odd number and four is an even number. 
And so this particular event where this kind of opening occurs, this rupture occurs, is when the teacher at the beginning of the lesson asks students if they have any questions about what they've been learning in this meeting that they had with some grade four students about, again, numbers and so on, um, odd and even. And this is followed, this was then planned by the teacher to be followed by small groups of students working on adding odd and even numbers together in small groups. But in this moment, when the teacher asks this question, because all questions, even though the teacher may not intend them to be completely open-ended, when they're received by students, it is a possibility. It's a horizon of possibility. And this one student asked this really interesting question. And as the teacher says, the discussion took an unexpected turn. So again, this is coming from um, Mathematics Teaching and Learning to Teach from the University of Michigan. And that there is a, this is an online resource that is available um, through the University of Michigan. So let's take a look. I'm going to stop the video here and I'm going to actually bring up a video for us to look at. More comments about the meeting? I'd really like to hear from as many people as possible what comments you had or reactions you had to being in that meeting yesterday. Um, I, don't, I don't have anything about the meeting yesterday, but I was just thinking about six. So was like, I was thinking that it's a, it's an ad, it can be an ad number two because there could be two, two, four, six, two, three, twos. That makes six and, uh -huh. and two threes. It could be an ad and an even number. So I'm just going to pause right there and just in case you couldn't hear it or you, if you can't read uh, the text on the bottom. The teacher asked, do you have any questions about the meeting yesterday? And a child in the class says, I don't have a question about the meeting, but I've been thinking about the number six, which is a really interesting thing for a young person to say. And then the more interesting thing is this kid asserts that he thinks the number six can be both an odd and even number. Now, this is a very unexpected thing to say, particularly uh, given the rules of odd and even numbers. And in, in any kind of teacher moment. It would be a teacherly move, and I think kind of an expected teacherly move, to kind of dismiss that child in a soft way, what I call killing ideas softly, and say something like, well, you know, Sean, why don't you think about that? You know, six is not an even and odd number. Can somebody help him out and help him understand how six is an even number? But that's not what this teacher did. This teacher decided to step into this horizon of possibility and try to understand what Sean was talking about, and to invite the other children to engage with this. So the teacher in this moment decided to take this beautiful risk and explore this idea rather than close this little opening down. So let's watch what happens when the kids and the teacher facilitating explore this assertion that six is both an odd and even number. Both. Three things to make it, uh -huh. And the two things that you put together to make it were odd, right? Three and three are each odd. Uh -huh. And the thing the other, the two, the two were even. So you're kind of, I think, said then that he wasn't talking about every even number, right? Were you saying that? Some of the even numbers, like six, are made up of two odds, like you just suggested. Mm -hmm. Other people's comments? I guess Six is an odd number. I think six can be an odd number because, look. Six, six can be an odd number because this is um, even, odd, even, odd, even, odd, even, odd, even. How can be an odd number? Because, because odd. even, odd, even, odd, even, odd. Yeah, because zero is not because, an odd number. Because Six, because there can be three of something to make six, and three of something is like add. Like, see, um, you can make two, four, six, three twos to make that, and two threes to make six. But that doesn't, that doesn't necessarily mean that six is odd. Yeah. Yeah. Why not? Because, just because you need uh, Two odd numbers to add up to the even number doesn't mean it has to be odd. Three twos. Grouped. One, two, three, four, five, six. Grouped. 
okay? Does everybody understand what he's trying to argue? He's saying six could be even or it could be odd. Because well, watch his, what he's going to prove and then you can ask see a question this, about it. Um, there's two. Number two over here. Put that there. Cut this here. There's two, two, and two. And that would make six. I know, which oh, is even. I think I know what he's saying. Oh, he's even. Could you stand here? People have some questions for you. I think what he is saying is that it's almost. See, I think what he's saying is that you have three groups of two, and three is an odd number, so six can be an odd number and an even number. Do other people agree with that? No. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Hey, do other people agree with him? Do you disagree with that? Yeah, I disagree with that because it's not according to like, here, can I show it on? It's not according to how many groups you, it is. Let's say that I have, let's say that I have six if you call six it on number, why don't you mean it? Let's see if I can find something. Let's say ten. One, two. And here are ten circles. And then you would split them, let's say I want you to split split them split them by two. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Then why do you not call ten it like uh an odd number and an even number? Or why don't you call other like numbers and odd numbers and it or and a even number. I didn't think of that right way. Thank you for bringing it up. So I say it's five, ten can be an odd and even. Yeah, but what about, what about what about other them? numbers? Like if you keep on going on like that and you say that other numbers are odd even, maybe it will end it up with all numbers are odd and even. Okay, so I think this is a very interesting video for a variety of reasons here. Um, and there's a beautiful moment where the kid who's presenting this idea says, I disagree with myself publicly saying that, which is a beautiful thing. And we have a very impassioned conversation um, with May trying to explain, well, you know, are all numbers odd and even? And so they kind of go through this kind of process and over time they decide that in fact, there are a certain set of numbers that have these qualities that Sean's describing. And maybe it's not accurate to call them both odd and even numbers, but they are a special class of numbers that can be grouped in groups of two. Um, even though they are seemingly odd numbers, they have these kind of even groupings possible. So like six and 10, and the, but not all numbers have that property as they decide. And so what they end, end up doing as a class is realizing that in fact, um, there is this new classification of numbers and they end up calling it Sean's numbers, the kid that initially brings it up. And so this is an example of exploring and refining and working through it to where this kid's idea actually benefits the learning and lives of others, at least their kind of mathematical understanding. And also the teacher, the teacher wrestled with this, but also realized that there's something mathematically rich happening here and that it was a beautiful risk to kind of explore it because they did in fact come up with a very rich mathematical conversation, but also a new way of thinking about a certain set of numbers. So I'm just going to share a couple more slides to kind of bring us home and think about how do we design, because this was kind of an unexpected moment. So how do we design for this? What role might technology play in these kinds of events? And then we'll open it up for Q&A. So as we kind of move into this, I think one of the examples that this shows us is that when we allow a learning stimulus, either one we design or, or a student's comment that's kind of open-ended, that has this kind of non-linearity, that invites multiple perspectives, that has this kind of future orientation to potentially generating something new, then 
it can allow young people to develop a kind of a primary creative learning outcome. Like Sean said, I think there are numbers that can be both odd and even. And then if we allow opportunities where to have the audience, so that could be the peers, um, anyone who's participating in that space, work through that, then it can actually lead to secondary creative outcomes where everyone benefits from that. So it is contributed to them. And technology serves as a way to kind of facilitate these kinds of experiences. But really, I think a powerful form of technology is just even this creative artifact of a video that's now online and available and we can benefit from it. So if we kind of gather and curate these artifacts of creative learning and pedagogy of the possible that are happening um, throughout the world, at least um, frequently throughout the world, then we can then kind of push it out into the world and have these artifacts that continuously contribute to the learning and lives of others. So that's what this kind of little image aims to show. And so I just want to conclude with this idea of, and when we go into my deep, I have a deep dive session coming up where we're going to really dig into, well, how do you design for these kinds of things? How do we engage in kind of systematic possibility thinking? And I just want to give you a quick way of thinking about this. As designers and educators, we want to think about what are the predetermined elements, the non-negotiable elements that we must have, and then allow ourselves to kind of remove some of the elements to allow for some to be determined elements where students get to determine maybe what the problems are or how to solve them and, or so on. Just like this teacher did, allowing this kind of to be determined event to occur by exploring this very unusual idea. And um, a beautiful visual metaphor that I really like is Picasso's bowl series. So in Picasso's bowl series, there's 11 lithographs and the very first one is in this top left corner this is the first lithograph Picasso produced. It's a very kind of fully rendered bowl. And in fact, the second one is even more rendered. And if we think about lesson design or learning design or ed tech design, we sometimes design a fully rendered bowl and then we give that to students and students reproduce it or something like that. But what I think this visual metaphor and what I'm inviting us to do is to start then removing elements. And so Picasso's final bowl, which makes it a Picasso is the one on the bottom middle. It's this very wireframe essence of bowl. What if we design learning experiences that just had this kind of wireframe component where it's just the essence of the lesson. There's, there's the criteria, the non-negotiables, but we allow the young people to add the definition. And I think one way of doing this is to kind of take this beautiful risk where we invite young people to identify their own problems to solve, their own ways of solving them, and their own ways of demonstrating their understanding. And I think we can't ask young people to do this unless we ourselves take these beautiful risks. So I have this little kind of reminder for us. And again, my deep dive will get into like, how do we actually design for pedagogies of the possible, design for creative openings.